Say, Stan, ought to be any minute now, huh? <laughs> I'll be there soon, Marshal. Well, sooner is better, because I'm ready, Stan. Oh, don't worry, Marshal. I'll be there. Just give me a little time. Well, been waiting a while here. Our audience is waiting. I'm busy, Marshal. I got a little kid. Okay, well, whenever you're ready, I'm ready. Yeah, I just hope you don't die before, before I get there. <laughs> yeah. It's the dress and shoe. Yeah. There we go. Oh, no, you can, you can see me, right? I can see you. Hi, Stan. Clearly. Hi, Marshall. How are you doing? Glad to see you. Nice to see you again. Everything going there uh, okay at home? <laughs> yeah, everything's going great. Uh, it's been an interesting week for me. Want to tell us about it? Uh, sure. I just launched the beta version of Proco 2.0, that thing I've been talking about for years. That's a big deal. Yeah, it's beta. It's closed beta. So, it's, I, I invited a, a small group of students to test it out. So far, po very positive experiences. I'm happy. Okay. But that's what's <laughs> been taking all of your time. Yeah. Re recently, yes. How about you? Well, I've been just sitting here for the last hour and three <laughs> minutes. <laughs> what? What do you mean? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm teasing. <laughs> not much new with me. It's Southern California and it's not sunshiny. That's a little unusual. <laughs> Does the weather really matter? Uh, yes. The weather matters <laughs> no, to, to me. To our listeners. Oh. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> what are we going to talk about today, Stan? Okay, so today we're going to it's it's very much related to the recreating art school series we did. Uh-huh. Very recently. Mm -hmm. But it, it's a it's a slightly it's a little branch off of it, right? We're going to be talking about how to be a good student. And more specifically, how to be a good art student. Yes. I think that if people watched or listened to the Recreating Art School series, uh, they'll get a lot of tips on just being a good student because recreating your own art school requires you to be a good student. And we talked about a lot of stuff in that. So, we'll see how much things we, re you know, how much we repeat in this one, but hopefully not too much. Yeah. Well, I think it's inevitable that we'll repeat stuff. And I do think that the people who take the time to watch eight podcasts on mm -hmm. recreating your own art school or how to go to art school are going to be the bunch that are some of the best. I think that they're motivated enough to say, I, I'm getting something out of this. I'm gathering that from some of the responses that I've got. And honestly, I think that between the two of us, mm -hmm. you have proven yourself to be a better and a more efficient student. But what we both have is we both have enthusiasm. I think we both come out of an excitement and, and just a love of the subject, which that's the first thing I'd say. If you don't have a love of the subject, if you don't have an enthusiasm for the subject, if it isn't something you want to do, you can still be a good student. But it makes it so much easier when it's work of choice. I found this out because I was not a good student oh. in elementary school and junior high, which they call it middle school now, and high school. I got decent grades, but I only got decent grades because I needed to get decent grades to not get in trouble. Mm -hmm. There was very little interest except in a few subjects and with a few teachers. And I did not intend to go to college. My mother bribed me to go to college. She knew that I liked <laughs> art and that I wanted to do art. And so, she told me, if you will go to college and be an art major, I'll buy all the art supplies you want. And I thought, that? I could do that. Okay. And even just going there and trying to go through all the rigmarole of signing up for classes was so complicated that I almost gave up. But once I got into classes, I was so excited to be surrounded by other students and by teachers who cared about 
getting good at art that I became a good student within a matter of a year. You know, I wasn't a very good student either for a long time. Elementary school, middle school. Why not? Um, I had a hard time paying attention. <laughs> that might be partly a boy thing. Sure. <laughs> partly. Not all boys have that problem, but sure. No, but I've heard this statistically. I remember certainly that way when I was in elementary school. And, and, and uh, Sure, yeah. Robert Sapolsky said the same thing happens with baboons. <laughs> God. The, the young baboons, the girls <laughs> learn from their mothers. Uh huh. The boys don't learn because they're out running around creating havoc. And so, it's uh, it, apparently there is something biological that's connected to this. Huh. Anyway, I'm trying to give you permission for having been a bad student <laughs> oh, or, or okay. not a great student. It started with first grade. I didn't speak English. I, I came to the United States when I was six years old. Really? I didn't know you didn't speak English when you came here. I just, I don't know why I no. assumed otherwise. No, I was six years old. We, my family just kind of suddenly decided to move. Um, I knew, I mean, my dad came here a year before us and during that year, I think my mom signed me up for like some kind of English class, but all I learned was how to count to 10. I, I didn't, they didn't teach a six-year-old how to speak English. They, you wow. know what I mean? And plus, it was like once a week sort of thing, right? For maybe a few months. Um, when I came here, I, I, no, I could not speak at all. I counted to 10. Wow. Um, and I came here in July. And so, just what was it? Like, what is that? Like two months later, I was already in first grade. And I didn't understand anything the teacher was saying. Huh. They, they throw you in, right? Just into class with everyone else. <laughs> you know? Wow, Stan. I didn't know that. That's a, yeah. That sounds harsh when you're six. Yeah. It, I was very confused. There was only about maybe a third of the time of my day where I would leave the regular class and go to the ESL class, the English second language. Um, and there they had someone who sp spoke, I think, Polish, <laughs> not even Russian, mm -hmm. and who could kind of speak to me and teach me a little bit of English. But mostly I learned through just absorbing it in, in class. Um, so, the first like two or three years, I, I struggled paying attention because I just didn't even understand what she was saying. So, how could I be interested when I didn't even know what they were saying, right? Yeah. Um, and the class wasn't made for people who didn't, don't speak. So, anyway, maybe that's where it started and then it kind of continued on through the rest of elementary school. Um, what was it like by the time you were in sixth grade, by the time you were 10 years old or, or, or 11 or 12? I was fluent at English by then. It, that wasn't an issue anymore. I think by third grade, I was fine. But I was still having a hard time paying attention. I just wasn't interested in a lot of subjects. Um, some things I liked, but some things I just didn't really care. Um, I mean, you know my personality. <laughs> if I don't care, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> by high school, I think I was a good student, but a bad learner. Uh, distinguish for me. I learned how to get good grades. I got good at taking tests. I, you know, I got, I got so good to the point where I could not come to class or not pay attention at all in class, like sleep. And then the next day there's a test on it. I could study for like 15 minutes before class and get 100% mm -hmm. on in Spanish. That's what I did throughout Spanish. It was it was so easy to memorize the stuff that cuz once you learn the teacher and you know what they're going to do, you know what they're <laughs> going to put on the test, you know exactly what you need to study or memorize and you do it. You know, some subjects you can't do that, right? Like you can't you know go to you know AP bio and study for 15 minutes before there's just too much material to read and understand but some subjects that's what I did and I aced them um but even just things like AP bio and stuff like you you would you you just learn the things you need to to get a good grade but not fully understand or observe the topic to the point where you know it enough to put it into pra any kind of practical form and that, that's what I think is the difference between learning it and just knowing it enough to get a good grade. And part of this was figuring out the teacher. Figuring out the teacher, figuring out how to work the tests. 
you know, being a knowing how to take a good guess on a test. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's where it becomes a contest. The competitive teacher <laughs> right. says, "Watch me trick you." <laughs> yeah, and the teachers didn't try to trick you either. At least my teachers didn't try to trick you. They were usually on our side and they would try to get us to get good grades. The benevolent teacher. Yeah. In high school, I started taking a lot of art classes too and those were ones I was actually interested in and that's what I spent a lot of my time doing at home is just doing art stuff. Uh huh. I was good at learning that stuff because I was actually interested. So, that, the thing you said at the very beginning of this episode, the passion, that's, mm-hmm. I feel like that is extremely important because without the passion, it's hard to find the drive to go through the hard work it takes to actually learn something at an efficient, you know, at a a fluent level. And also, when you're in high school, your your brain is so ready to learn the important things about art. It's, uh, you're enthusiastic about it. Uh, it, They're almost all graspable concepts by the time you're in high school. So, that when you get good training in high school, as you seem to have done. I got the kind of the, like an intro basic level. I mean, high school in general isn't really, at least in the United States, it's not, it's government controlled, right? Like it's made for teaching the, the, the general person how to, te- how to draw, not someone who's really passionate about it. Now, I did have a good uh, few teachers there that really cared and they, they, they knew when one student was really interested and really passionate about it that they gave us extra resources. So, I started studying at Watts Atelier when I was a junior in high school. So, I was going to a, you know, an atelier, co- you know, college level art school two years out of my high school years, right? Um, so, I, I mean, I obviously learned more about drawing there than I did in high school. Mm-hmm. I, I think I said before, I, teach, I took four years of animation in high school every semester and the animation teacher was great. What a wonderful way to start out too, to start out with having uh, someone train you who's training you toward animation. Yeah. You've got to simplify your drawing. Mm-hmm. You, are, you are aiming it toward an end to tell a story. There's just so much in it. I wish that I'd had animation training yeah. early on. Yeah, that's what kind of gave me that passion. That re- it was really intense passion of art. The the drawing wasn't as intense until I was, you know, into Watts Atelier. But the animation made it fun for a high school student. It wasn't just about drawing a, a picture. It was about telling a story. And that made it much more interesting to to learn to draw in order to do that. It had a bigger purpose to me at the time. Yeah. How do you want to do this today? With our mouths. But I mean the order. (laughs) I think we could just like throw stuff. No specific order. Just jump all over the place. Yeah, boy, that's chaos. Just jump around. We'll start with what I think is the the age where your brain alights, uh, 11 years old or so and you decide, I want to be a really good artist. Well, in the next few years, you're going to be learning the craft. And here are some things that will help you to do better with it. And my first thing is let's choose what you're interested in to start. That way you're excited about this and you own it. It's nobody putting you onto it. You are embracing it, inviting it yourself. That's the first thing I'd say. Enthusiasm, passion. In fact, Itzhak Perlman, the great violinist. Years ago, I remember seeing him on TV, I think it was in the 1980s, and the interviewer was asking him, how do you, something like, how do you become a great violinist? And he said there were three things, talent, training, and an absolute passion for the music. And I wrote that down. He believes in talent, that there's raw material that can or cannot. I know that that's, that's under question now. Training, certainly, that's what a lot of people don't get at quickly. It's what I missed. I, I needed better training. Uh, but the absolute passion for it, that's where, that's where I'd start. Then, then where? Where would you take it from there? I have basically a, a list of qualities that I think make a good student and some tips, some advice. 
And there's a bunch. So, I mean, if you want me to go through this, it's going to take the rest of the episode. Um, I think we should have a conversation about about a bunch. Good. Let's just use your list as our structure. Okay. My list is not very structured. <laughs> it is very randomized. Some things are related. But, I mean, the first thing I want to start with, and I think this is kind of an obvious one, is that you have to take it seriously. You don't go to school and just go through the motions and kind of hope that the school provides you with the structure that we talked about and you kind of just do the things that are expected of you and that you come out on the other side the way they want you to come out and you're set. Don't do that. You need to actively try to learn. Everybody learns differently and you know yourself better than anybody else. And so, you need to make sure that everything that you're studying you are actually trying to learn that thing. Even if you have a bad teacher or the, the, you know, you're done with chapter one, you're moving to chapter two, but you still are interested in chapter one, continue learning it. You know, it's not, you don't just follow the lesson plan. This is your education. So, take charge of it and do everything you can to Make sure that you're understanding everything the, to the point that you're satisfied with it. And I think that, that general mentality kind of encompasses everything, I'm, uh, I'm, all the tips I'm about to say. <laughs> it, it's kind of a, a general attitude. Hear ye him. Okay. Are you a pirate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do think everything else comes out of that. And, and that attitude is rare in a lot of college classes. It is not rare among the people whom I've seen in the profession who've succeeded. Their attitude was that I'm, I'm going to find this one way or another. It's mm -hmm. self-motivation. Yeah. yeah. That's been a theme of what we've talked about. Cool. You want me, you want me to keep going? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, let, let me stop, for, stop us for a second. Yeah. You, you know, one of the most common questions we get over and over is that I, I'm not motivated. I'm not sure. I don't mm -hmm. have a vision. That seems to be the one of the biggest problems, which mm. is I think yeah. why we have not been that helpful. You know, for for people who are, are lacking motivation, I don't uh, I don't know what to say except this is the first thing: choose the thing that you really want to do. If there isn't a drive in there, if there isn't an emo a motivation, that is a question worth spending some time with. What is it that I do want to do? Yeah, you do have to figure out why you don't have motivation. And it could be, uh, there's a lot of things that be, could be causing it and, and you do have to identify it. But some of those things could possibly be you're not sleeping enough, your diet is bad, you're not exercising, you have bad habits of being lazy. Um, that you need to get rid of. Um, the people around you maybe are impacting your decisions. Maybe, you know, you just kind of hang out with people that aren't disciplined and are not passionate about something. And so, you kind of follow that pattern of the thing, the people around you. So, surround yourself with people who have passion in, yeah. in, in the thing that you're, in your, that you're doing. Sometimes that is difficult to do. You might be living somewhere where there isn't anyone interested in that. But, yeah. These, are, these are just general tips that I'm kind of throwing out there. You have to identify what is causing that lack of drive. Big, big deal. And, and you know, when, when people are asking over and over, I'm, what they're, or asking for help with problems, I don't know how many times I just say community, community, community. Mm -hmm. You don't have people that are giving you feedback. You are, not, you are not among others. But hey, here is something that can help tap into it. We did this on Monday night with the uh, creativity lessons from master filmmakers class. In fact, we spent maybe 15 or 20 minutes in our online class time doing this. It is to make a list. If you, if your project that you're working on, your, your dream project, if you knew that it was going to succeed, how would you do it differently than what you're planning? I know it's going to succeed, so I don't have to worry about the risk and spend some time in class, we spent five or 10 minutes on that, but you could spend a few days on that if I knew it was going to succeed and then flip into the other mode. If I knew it would fail, 
So they're never, it's never going to see the light of day. What would I do just to indulge myself? That's what Mel Brooks did in working with Richard Pryor and others that we're, we've got money to develop this. It's never going to happen. They're never going to put this on screen. So write whatever movie you would want to write. And they wrote Blazing Saddles. And of course, that became a part of history. But their attitude was it's, it's, gonna, it's never going to happen. So where would we dare to go? That might tap into taking away the concern for whether it succeeds or doesn't and narrowing down to what do I just, what do I want to do? Sometimes asking if you had a billion dollars, what would you work on? <laughs> that is a way to get at what's inside me that is driven by desire, but that is blocked by anxiety over whether it will not, whether it will work. Right. If you didn't have to make money with the thing that you're choosing to do, what would you do? That's where the passion is. That's worth taking time with, not just saying, okay, I've taken one minute with it, but actually spending some time and talking about it with the people around you and, and waiting until you get the little voice that comes up and says, yeah, this is what you want to do. That can make a big difference in your motivation. Okay, what's the next thing? The next thing is related to questioning things, right? Not, not just trusting the status quo, um, trying to conform to fit in all the time. I mean, there's a balance. You don't want to just be different just to be different either, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if, if teachers are telling you rules, hard set rules, question those with respect, of course. You still want to respect your teacher. You don't want to make any enemies and be a jerk in class or a smart ass either. Respectfully question why. Um, and you don't even have to do it publicly. You could just go home and research it and see, okay, wh wh why is this? Um, or have a conversation with your classmates about it. Like, what do you guys think? Is this true? Like, why is it true? Yeah. If that kind of curiosity, first of all, if it in ends up being true, what the teacher said, you'll learn a lot more about that thing that the teacher said, because now you know why. Yeah. If it ends up not being true, now you know more about the thing that you said. Right. It's, and, and honestly, like any good teacher will respect and actually enjoy a student that has that kind of mentality, mm -hmm. in a, again, in a respectful way. Because all it means is that the student cares enough to do more research on the thing. You know, not just like, oh, you said that? Okay, cool. I'll write it down in my notes. <laughs> yeah. So, that, that's just gen generally being curious and questioning things. I believe in that and I do believe that good teachers are... Let's, for, let's first of all deal with what you started out, not just as a smart ass. There are some people who cannot, uh, who cannot learn because all they want to do is shoot the people who are actually out there on the stage. Yeah. There are some people who just like to fight and they really aren't interested in learning. But when you get a, a student who deeply cares and ha wants the conviction of this, it's the difference between kind and wicked learning. Have you ever heard that term? Kind and no. Kind and wicked learning. Uh, David Epstein, which one of our listeners referred me to, did a podcast in which he referred to research done by three people on the difference between kind and wicked learning. Kind learning is where the teacher teaches and then tests the student and the questions on the test match what, what the teacher teaches. So, as a student, you get kindly taught stuff that you then show that you know it and that's kind. Wicked learning is where there is a mismatch between what you are taught and what happens in the real world that doesn't fit the theory that you expected because of the teaching you got. And wicked learning means you've got to make choices, refigure it out. It's harder, but David Epstein referred to, I think it was some Navy training or something where they had a group who were taught a procedure. Learn this procedure, we do the procedure, we do the procedure over and over, it becomes easy. And those people were quite satisfied in doing their job because it wasn't that hard. 
But when the, 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 the people being trained were given a different situation every time to where the challenge didn't fit the information they were given, they were frustrated. And they were frustrated and frustrated until they started to give the two groups problems to solve and the second group who experienced wicked learning destroyed the first group because they learned how to apply the knowledge or how, excuse me, not how to apply it, but how to figure out the problem. So that's a difference between learning to take the test and passing the test right. and then you don't have any practical skills and then doing the thing where you've got the knowledge and you try to work it out in, real, in the real world and it doesn't work and then you've got frustration, but you're also going through the difficulty of applying this knowledge, which is much more practical than passing all the tests. That's exactly what I was saying about my being good at being a good student, but a bad learner in high school. I wasn't, I wasn't bragging. I was saying that's a horrible thing I did. That is the completely wrong approach to learning. But well, you 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 went into a kind environment and yeah. you brought your own wickedness. I brought my own wickedness. <laughs> what do you mean? You went into a place that gives you information. Yeah. Tests you on it. Yeah. And you figured I'll I'll just figure out how to pass the test without. Yeah. You made you made it practical so that you could get good grades without even having to be that concerned with the. I was trying to figure out how I could get good grades in the the smallest amount of time possible, with the least amount of effort, so that I yeah. could focus on other stuff because I really didn't want to do it. Yeah. But yeah, no, that's a really that's a really good story. I'm glad I, I've never heard of that that training. Let's put the link. Okay. David Epstein had a podcast. I'd like to listen a little more about that. Let's go back to the maxim that you brought up though. What was this? This was to... Questioning things. Questioning things. Yes. Yeah. Why? Having... Just being curious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, I thought you were asking me why. <laughs> you know, there is a difference between arguing energy and curiosity. You notice it in, in political arguments. One person just wants to make their point and the other person wants to make their point and they never affect each other. Right. But when there is genuine curiosity as to where does that come from, where does that uh, belief come from, mm -hmm. then there is genuine learning going on. There's exploring as to why the clash of right and wrong and the clash of rights happens in political conflict. And the only people I ever talk, I've got two people in my life that I talk uh, two and a half that I talk about politics with a lot and it's enjoyable. And it's not that we're even necessarily together on it, but when there's a spirit of curiosity, trying to understand where it's going to go, trying to understand where it came from, it can really be enjoyable because there is learning going on, not just posturing. So questioning comes out of a spirit of curiosity. Yeah, and it, it does come back to what I said in the beginning, that mentality of not going through the motions, but doing what you can to learn as much as possible, right? Your, your motive is to learn. So, you're not questioning the teacher to make the teacher look stupid. Mm -hmm. You're questioning the teacher because you want to learn. So, when it comes from there, then it, it, I think it's good. <laughs> Everyone's on the same team. Starting out with a good spirit. Yeah. Okay. What's the next one? This is kind of going down a different path. Uh, uh, having thick skin and seeking feedback. So I know there's students that kind of uh, that like to kind of stay in the back, not participate. They are afraid of feedback because they're going to feel bad about themselves, and that makes sense. You know, maybe they already kind of feel bad about themselves and ha getting some kind of bad feedback will just take that to the next level. Um, so, I don't know, like that's that's kind of the the goal is to have thick skin and seek fe feedback. Do you have any advice on how to get thick skin? <laughs> uh, no, but I can tell a little story about okay. being in therapy. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's, let's hear it. Having spent a, a fortune on therapy and it does not mean that I'm not screwed up. It just means that I spent a lot of money and I have something to say about it. One of the worst things you can do 
is to go into therapy and and not be frank and open with the, the struggles that you've got. Uh, because the therapist's job as a detective, if they're a good therapist, is to figure out what's the source of this and how can we get at this without just pointing the fire extinguisher at the tip of the flame where the hottest part is. They are looking for the core problem underneath the presenting problem. And to be very clear about the presenting problem, uh, therapists have heard it all. And then they can figure out, okay, here's what we're dealing with. It's all been laid out. But the idea is if we go into therapy trying to protect ourselves, then we are not going to, it's, it's going to be way, way, way more expensive and take much longer. Uh, so that's my first advice if you go into therapy is to tell the truth and uh, get it all out and answer the questions honestly. And then it's not like you're going into the doctors and you've got jaundice and you're going to put makeup over it so that you will not be humiliated. You just bear the situation. And I think the same thing happens even in an art class is that if you aren't willing to put your work up early on and get feedback, granted that you've got a teacher whom you trust not to humiliate you, but to look at the work and say, here's what we need to work on. Granted that you are in that kind of an environment, that's, uh, that's an attitude to take. Uh, Drew Struzan told us as professionals who were going there to learn from him back in 1985 that you've got to check your ego at the door. And it's much harder than it sounds. Yeah. The idea is you're seeking feedback and not hiding from what I'm not, what's, what isn't working. Is that correct? Yeah. Jeff said that all the time is to check, you know, leave your ego at the door. Or leave your personal problems at home. You're here to focus and learn um, and leave your ego at the door. But I, I didn't listen to that, <laughs> obviously. You know. Well, it's easy to tell somebody else to check their ego at the door. It's very hard to tell myself to check my ego at the door. Well, it's an emotional response to something. You're not, you, you forget to think about your, your instinctual response at that very moment and you just respond and then you're like, ah, crap, <laughs> you know, you have to train yourself to, to not act with an ego. It takes, How? it takes growing up, oh, just growing up. How do I train myself to not act with an ego? You act with an ego and you get laughed at and then you realize, oh crap, I need to work on it. And then over time you just slowly become more aware of it and then you, you just grow up. <laughs> so humiliation is a part of the process that nobody gets spared. This is my personal story. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. There's probably multiple ways. That's the only way I know of. I think the less humiliation, the better and the more. Okay. Let's look at it and say, okay, what can be better here? And we're, we're fellow travelers. Well, it's hard not to get humiliated a little bit when you're you know, acting with a big ego. People laugh at you. You know, we laughed at a student who did a voicemail that we're editing right now who asked about whether ballpoint pen was a viable medium. <laughs> Sorry. If, if I were him, how would I feel? And what I hope is that it was affection for the fact that that thought can get into your head is it a viable medium? And we're looking at it saying that's a not a good question, but then it gets zapped, you know, it gets zapped and you say, okay, that was a question that I believed or I heard or I was, I was, I was asking about it. Yeah, sometimes you, you do need to be slapped a little bit. <laughs> In a case of whether ballpoint media, pen is a viable yeah. medium. <laughs> yeah. For that question, I'm sure there are many good questions to come from you. Therapy isn't for everyone, but if you're interested in having a session with a trained therapist, you should look into my sponsor, BetterHelp. They've taken the traditional model of therapy and completely streamlined the process by putting everything online. Sessions are controlled by you, and you're not just limited to the therapists that are in your local area. With over 3,000 US licensed professionals, BetterHelp will help you find the right therapist. I like the control BetterHelp gives me during this process. When you sign up, not only do they ask you about the kind of therapy you're seeking, 
but they also take into account your personal preferences. Feel more comfortable talking with a male or female therapist? BetterHelp will take that into account. Religious? Maybe you'll want to be paired with a therapist that shares your faith. These options and more are available when you fill out their questionnaire. Right now, BetterHelp is offering all Draftsman listeners 10% off your first month with discount code Draftsman. To get started, go to betterhelp.com slash Draftsman. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash draftsman so there's a few things on my list that we talked about a lot before so and i just want to mention them because they are important uh but we talked about them so much i don't think we should discuss them um one is do more than what is assigned you know it, it goes with several things we actually already said in this episode is you know you you got some homework don't just stop there do more than that. Do what it takes to learn the actual thing. Um, good students are usually disciplined. I say usually, but yeah, discipline is a big deal. We've talked about that. Uh, and a good student is usually organized. Ooh. Enough. Ah. Organized enough. Mm. <laughs> I know. I that's why I added the word enough in there because when I wrote that down, I was like, "Really?" <laughs> I started questioning myself. Like, is a good student usually organized? And then I realized, like, n- you can have like I'm not that organized, but I'm organized enough to the point where my the disorganized part of it doesn't get in the way, and when it does, I fix that to the and just enough to be so it doesn't get in the way does that make sense it makes sense stan and i overestimated how organized you were because i see you as so much more organized (laughs) than i am i've watched you over the years and thought wow he's organized but it's partly because i'm so i have i had a tough time with it i was not organized and i learned through pain there was a, a guy that i really admired in junior college who I wanted to be friends with. And we had an appointment to get together at my parents' house. And I remember coming home one time in an afternoon and he was there and I said, how long have you been here? And he said, I've been here for two hours. And I, I had forgotten that I had that appointment because I had two calendars. And I didn't know that that's one rule about calendars. Don't have two of them. <laughs> have one of them. And (laughs) so, it was through the pain of having damaged that relationship that I got my act together on having one calendar. But a lot of it, a lot of uh, learning to be organized just came out of pain. Oh, you had two calendars. I had two separate calendars and that appointment was- Oh, I thought you had two tasks. That appointment was not on the the good looking calendar that had the, (laughs) the artwork on it. Okay. This was on, it was on the other one that was a practical one and I had looked yeah. at it and forgotten. You, you get the idea. Yeah, I get it. I get it. That, that, that's funny. Sometimes we learn organization through pain, but better to have someone teach us. I mean, there would be a good thing there, you know, to take the, the first class is, that you should take is how to be a good student and that would include at least one thing on how to be an organized student. I also want to mention that being organized doesn't necessarily mean being clean. It could, <laughs> but not always. It, 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 I, I know I'm slowing us down by asking, but how would you be a, an organized student and not be clean? What's that mean? Well, organized, being organized goes beyond just you know, having a clean desk or something or, or a vacuumed floor. Um, it's <laughs> having, <laughs> having systems to put, put down your thoughts taking notes in a way that you can find them later mm-hmm. um, have, and also having a note system where you can put things in it at any moment, right? Like I, I have a pretty organized way of taking notes through my phone that's connected to my computer. Um, I used to do it all through like email, you know, I would email myself some notes and that would just get lost. Yeah, but That's yeah. an unorganized way of taking notes. So, now I have 
list taking software that I go through that I can access with any device at any point, whether I'm on a walk or I just got out of the shower and I got to quickly write something down. Um, that's just an example of, of one way of being organized. Um, not just physically, but mentally. Yeah. And I think the earlier that we get organized, the better because creativity and learning happen in emotional states of flow when you've got ideas and they're just coming to you like crazy, but you do not have a way to document them or they get into one file and another file and written on a post-it note here and written on a piece of paper over there and spoken to a friend over here and they're all over the place. It means you've got lots of raw material but it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to access it or even put it into anything that is organized. So to have the structure, the empty structure that I know how I want to arrange my containers and keep them together, uh, and then you are prepared for when the crop of ideas and the learning is going on. So you don't have to think about it later. Somebody yeah. said or organizing is so that you don't have to think about organizing. <laughs> right. You just think about the content that you're working on. Yeah. One issue for me for a long time was just I had too many buckets to put stuff in. I still have that problem, yeah. You still have too many buckets? Yeah. yeah. You got to consolidate. Yep. Um, it's really great with the with how our, all our devices could be connected now. Yeah. I, I always try to make sure that if I'm using something, I can access it through my phone. Uh, it's always in the cloud um, so that I don't have a situation where oh, I want to add something to that one note, but I'm going to have to just put it in a different bucket temporarily and then remember to move it later to this other place. When you have too much stuff like that floating in your head, your head, your, your mind just becomes cloudy and you, and you forget to do all this stuff and you lose things. And I, I hate that when my head gets that way. On a scale of one to 10, where would you put yourself right now as far as being organized? What's a 10? If, 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 if 10 was where it's never an issue, you never lose information, you never lose anything, everything is efficient because you know where it is, every, a place for everything and everything in its place, that's a 10. And a, a 1 would be most of your energy is wasted on having to find things and sort through them and where are you? Oh, man, I, I think right now I'm pretty good. I, I, I would say I'm like a 9. Are you really? At least specifically with the uh, the things that I want to be organized in with information, and I'm I'm thinking of just information. Yeah, yeah, just information. Yeah, my systems right now are good. Like my emails are a mess. Yeah, but I don't mind because I don't put anything really important in there anymore. I learned not to do that. See, I haven't learned that, and my emails are at about a one or a two. Probably same here, a one or a two in my emails, but it's just like. I'm, I'm almost just like giving up on emails. It's like, ah, man, like it's not the best way of communicating and it's also not the best way to structure your day mm -hmm. or organize anything. It's kind of, it's, I forgot who said it. I, I think a lot of people have said it at this point. It's like email is other people's to-do list for you. Hmm. That's good. Yeah. Th that's why it's such a burden. Yeah, it's a you wake up and you've got all these emails and people are asking you to do things and reply to them and ask and you know asking you questions and if you start with that you're like oh crap it's one o'clock and I haven't done the things I'm supposed to do. Yeah. Um. So you you gotta treat email correctly. <laughs> what is your main structuring system now? If email is not. Uh, Workflowy is the where I take notes. It's my bucket where I kind of like throw ideas and it lives in there. Sometimes that's what the only place it goes is it lives in, in workflowy. It's just, a, it's like a, it's an infinite list. You could just keep adding things to this list and you can indent infinitely. Yeah. So, it's like branches of thoughts. And so, I have several categories as on my like, my main structure of like business, personal. And then within that is like categories that break it down even further. And so, whenever I take a note, I put it in the right place when I write it. Um, and then Google Docs is where things go from being just notes to being actual, you know, documents that are shared with others and, mm -hmm. to, you know, taken into something that is more of a final product. Do you take notes by hand or digitally or both? I take notes digitally now because 
I don't want to have to convert it to digital later. I know that some people prefer to write it down because I guess it, you memorize it better if you actually write it. I don't know if there's, is there research on that? Maybe, I don't yes, know. Yes, there is research on okay. that. But if you write it out longhand, mm -hmm. it's going to stick with you better than if yeah. you type it in for whatever reason. Yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't experienced that personally. Mm -hmm. um, when I write it out, I just, I'm like, I'm trying to write it really quickly and I, I'm, I'm really sloppy and it, I don't know, it, it doesn't help me. Uh, typing it out to me it works just fine. Mm -hmm. And I'm more likely to revisit it mm -hmm. because it's organized. My notes are there. I go back to it. I remember it. Um, I could search for it. That's a big thing for me is searching through my notes. I can't do, perform a quick search in my notepad, my, my physical notepad. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, everyone could have their own system. That's just mine. Everyone has their own system. I've yeah. got one that I've landed on that I really like. I, I expect to use it for the rest of my life. I take notes by writing it out by hand chaotically, not in an order, but filling up a page and just starting in one portion and then filling in areas so that it's a mess. It's okay that it's a mess because the real learning is going to happen later when I transfer those notes using dictation, speech to text software into digital and taking a lot of time to do that, reordering it, thinking about it. And that's where most of the learning takes place. I also enjoy that too. I enjoy sitting down and just filling the page like a bunch of doodles. And then <laughs> later, slowing it down and analyzing what should go where. Yeah. Okay. I feel like this is not something that I am qualified to teach though, because as an uh, being organized, I, I somewhere between typically between a four and a six. The mm. only thing I've ever been good at organizing is a train of thought when I'm going to spend hours on that train of thought in an outlining program because I can throw the chaos into that program and then start to indent and collapse and that kind of thing. And to spend hours on that is very enjoyable for me. And so, yeah. you spend hours and hours on it and eventually you get this train of thought that makes sense. I, since I enjoy that. I enjoy it more than improvising. I mean, even like what we're doing here, we're we're just pulling stuff out of whatever is our in instinct to say. Yeah, you, I I learned you're very good at that by watching you go, you know write scripts and and um, brainstorm lesson ideas and work on the perspective course. <laughs> I'm not. That was not meant to be a a little a little punch. <laughs> not consciously. <laughs> Okay, what's the next one? Prioritizing your time. <laughs> I guess that ends there. I think people know what that means. I've, I've also told several stories about time management already. Yeah. And I don't know if I should do it again. Yeah, I don't know that uh, even that we're the best ones to do this because there's courses in how you put color coding or you put numbers on the priorities and you, you've got columns and, and rows and that kind of thing to say this happens first, that happens second. But the, the whole thing we're saying here is that before you even start studying the subject that you're interested in, you are building an infrastructure. We are building an infrastructure for I'm going to go into this and be ready to live. The building is built. Now I'm going to go live inside it. Yeah, th that is kind of a form of organization, isn't it? It's it's a way of organizing your time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's also subject independent. Right. Doesn't make any difference whether you're studying biology or art. It applies to both. It's specifically about for being a student, it's about, you know, prioritizing what's most important. Do I and what's most important right now um, is like, do I study information, do more research? Do I practice and I just like go sketch? Do I go enjoy the subject somehow just by having fun with it? Um, all of these things matter and you have to prioritize. <laughs> Did we talk last season about arranging a calendar so that it has an elegance in its arrangement? Um, probably not because I'm not sure what you mean by an elegance to its arrangement. Since the calendar is composition of life, it's composition of time, mm -hmm. 
Uh, I dealt with this even in the last month. We were going to have the Bridgman course on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And uh -huh. I had a class on Monday night. It was during the daytime for me. I had a class on Monday night and Tuesday night. And I contemplated that calendar for so long. And it was so discomforting the way that thing was arranged. And then I finally decided, and it took some rearranging things to just cluster all of the figure drawing stuff over here on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And that mm. way my mind is free for Monday and Tuesday, and then I've got a day in between subjects to rest. And that was prioritizing the calendar's arrangement to not exhaust me and confuse me. And oh, there's such a sense of satisfaction that, ah, oh, I've got a better graphic design, a better composition for how to arrange life in this coming month. Yeah, that's a big deal. Constantly switching topics in your head is a waste of energy switching things, switching what you're doing and what you're thinking about takes time. And so, if, if you, you know, if you got two really important things to do in one day, you're working on one, that other thing can get in your way because you, you, you're thinking about that as well. And both things end up not being done as well as they could be. Yeah. If you have two tasks, if you start with the first one, then you switch to the second one, then you go back to the first one, that's very inefficient because you have to kind of backtrack a little bit on that first one again. Um, so, yeah, that what you did is, cl you know, clustering like things together. I think that's a really good idea. And sometimes you do alternate because you've got enough of this, now I need a dose of that. Now a dose of that, now we got enough of this. But I think that that's one, one helpful hint about organizing time is to get it out graphic on your calendar and say, I like this. I like the way it looks. The next one on my list is presenting your work like you care, like it's a job. Uh, and actually, I think you've said before, just like treating your study as if it's a, is a job. You said something like, like your teacher is your boss. Did you say that? I talked about this, metaphors for the classroom, yeah. Like your teacher is your boss and these projects you're working on are like real jobs. And so now, you, or not necessarily your boss, maybe just a client. And now you have to present this project as if you're getting paid for it and the grade is how much you get paid or whatever. I did make that point to say that it's pretend. The teacher is not the boss. The right. teacher you is the, the supplier <laughs> and you are the boss. But the, the yeah. teacher plays that role so that you are rehearsing to when it actually becomes somebody who's paying you as opposed to the other way around. But yes, the presentation in a group of people is respect for the group of people which means that the slide that you present or the work you present, you figure out how many people you're showing it to, how big it's going to be, the architectural school 10-foot rule that anyone who's 10 feet away from it should be able to see it clearly to make sure that you've maximized the space of the presentation you make and you haven't made it so that you got a big slide and little tiny thing in there or was shot with a cell phone and it's all somewhere in all that lost contrast. That's not taking the environment of learning seriously. Taking it seriously is that every time you make a presentation, you put energy into this presentation as if you were in the real paying world. Yeah, when I get uh, requests for critique, and this is online, so they're sending me photographs of their work, not showing me the real thing, and I get a really bad photograph of their drawing where I can't even see the lines or there's a big shadow going across and it's taken at an angle. It doesn't really help me be motivated to give you a critique. It shows me that you, you as the student don't really care enough about your work. Then why should I? <laughs> right? And I know that it, I still should. But it, I can't help but think that. It doesn't help to motivate me. So, as a student, you, should, you shouldn't give your teacher that barrier of trying to stay motivated to help you even though you just show that you really don't care enough about your, your own work. Um, and don't make it harder for them to, to critique you either. You know, if I can't see certain things, then it's, it's harder for me to critique it. And a lot of students don't know to do that. They just haven't given it thought. 
Yeah. But it's something to give thought early on. And eventually, when once uh, once criteria have been explained that this is going to be shown to a group of 30 people, or this is just going to be between me and you, then it will be taken care of, not by instruction, but by an attitude. Then you've got the wicked environment, right? The, the wicked learning environment. I have got to figure out, I was going to make a presentation just to these two or three people. And now I found out 10 minutes beforehand that it's going to be a group of 20 people. <laughs> I've got to think quick for how I'm going to make sure this works with that many people. That is a, an attitude of getting into the head of your audience and asking what is it that they need. They need to be able to see it. They need to make, be able to make it efficient. They don't want to sit around and wait for you to deal with technical problems. That is that's what you've got to do in an environment, any uh, professional environment anyway. Why not start in the classroom? Okay, uh, where else? Uh, Did you really just burp on a draftsman podcast? I'm showing what you shouldn't do in class. Don't be like Bart Simpson. Bart Simpson is an example of a really bad student. <laughs> Well, he also proved himself over and over. Have you seen Bart gets an F? It's one. It's is it in the first episode or first season? I only know the first three seasons. Okay, but Bart gets an F, which I've I've shown to students about twenty times. I feel like Bart gets an F and Krusty gets busted are two of the most well crafted stories in the history of the human race. Wow, they, they are so perfectly crafted, and Bart has got this label of being a bad student. When in fact, he's one of the smartest kids of the bunch. And so the way to get protagonist empathy is that everybody has had trouble in school. So we just label him as the bad student and show where he's bad. Then we connect with him. And then in connecting with him, we start to see how you can be brilliant. Let's see. Oh, this one's this one is big, I think. Um, getting real world experience while you're a student. You mentioned William Stout when I interviewed him, how he said that when he was in college, I believe, his yeah. school gave credit for real world stuff. So instead yeah. of doing the real projects that were assigned to him or, or the fake projects, he would do the real world projects and get credit for those instead. Yeah. Um, or, or it was a class. He would get class credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'd get class credit. And that's cool. But even if your school doesn't do that, you should still try to get like little mini jobs, you know. Um, or maybe, you know, the thing I did was that I would, um, even as like a teenager, my parents' friends would hire me to do portrait commissions. Mm -hmm. And that was great real world experience because I was actually getting paid. I needed to, I had a client, I had a, a deadline. And I needed to do something good in that time. Um, it was great training for me to to start taking projects like that seriously. And I think that it's never too early to start that. Yes. It's never too early. That's a great way. It's a risky way, but it's a great way to design your own education is to get any kind of jobs and hire people to help you with them and teach you as you do them. Even if you're like eight years old. Well, yeah, why not? It's being, it's being, that's mentorship. Yeah. Let me tell my story of that. When I did not know digital and I got an opportunity to do digital jobs before I even had a computer, in fact, it was for Mad Magazine, uh, I took the money that they paid me to hire people around me who knew how to use these tools. And I spent all the money that I made from the job to hire mentors. Uh, one or two of them weren't that good. And they didn't, it, it, it was not money well spent, but they were only people I had. But a couple of them were very good and helped me to learn Photoshop. And it was before the internet. It was, I mean, even the manuals were very difficult to learn it from. But so that was it. I've got a deadline. I've got work to do. I've got to meet this deadline. I'm not completely familiar with it, but I've got a team of people who are going to teach me as we work. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, that's a big one. To learn while working. How did you phrase it? Get real world experience. Get real world experience. Yeah. I only have one more left. And this is pretty much what we did in, the, I think, the last episode, depending on the order we published this in. But it's teach. 
<laughs> Learn by teaching. We have a full episode on it, so we should not, and we're about to release it, so. Yeah. It might already be released by the time this one comes out. It was that if you understand it enough to explain it, then you know it. Yeah. Or to put it the other way around, if you want to make sure you understand it, explain it to someone who doesn't know it and see if you got it through, and that way you've struggled through the simplicity of the thinking. If you're stumbling with your words explaining it, that means you don't have it organized in your head yet. And if you're not able to simplify the concepts into something that someone who doesn't already understand it now gets it, um, then you need to go back and, and figure out what it is that you don't understand. Why can't you simplify it? It's how you learned anatomy, right? <laughs> I knew anatomy when I started the anatomy course, come on. But I learned a lot more you about it. You learned a lot by yes. teaching it, yes. At that point, I was already studying anatomy for like eight to ten years. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but actually, you might be right because I did learn a lot of anatomy teaching at Watts before I even taught the online class. Yeah. And I think I did not really know that much anatomy going into teaching those classes. So, yeah, you're probably right. I, I learned anatomy by teaching it. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard people criticize teachers. I've had people criticize me that, that uh, he doesn't know it as well as other people do. And I'm happy to have a teacher who doesn't know it as well as other people do if that teacher makes it so that I can learn it easily. And if they're only one chapter ahead of me in the book, <laughs> but they make it easy to then move into the next bit of, bit of information, that's great. That's uh, parsing it out. And I, I, we might have mentioned this, that if you want to learn something well, uh, find someone else, they're going to learn something well, and each one gives reports to the other. And this means that by learning it and then repeating it, you sink it in and then they get the benefit of getting an efficient education in it. It's a great way for symbiotic learning. And it happens in healthy communities all the time. It just happens naturally. Right. What are you reading? What are you learning? Oh, I'm learning this. What are you getting out of it? Oh, yeah. Well, here's what the teacher said, but here's what we did. And you know, here's what I found out. And just that exchange makes learning happen really rapidly, really naturally. Nice. Well, I'm done. You got anything else you want to add? One of the things we had on our list was that social skills are a part of learning. And that's part of what I was just mentioning is that in a healthy social environment, we work to explain things clearly and save people time if they're trying to learn something. And some people's educations do get hampered by the fact that they just don't do well with others. And so, they don't get the benefit of what others are learning and sharing. You have any thoughts about that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're difficult to work with because of, you know, a lack of social skills, it affects the teacher as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that at Watts, there were several students who were just really difficult to be around. Mm -hmm. I know the teachers didn't want to help them. They didn't have a desire. Mm -hmm. To, to go around and, and hang, you know, give them advice because they're probably going to get some, an unpleasant experience from that. Um, you know, the teachers still put effort into it, but it was, it was small, a smaller effort than for the students that were very pleasant to be around. Uh, it's just human nature, right? Yeah. <laughs> Enjoyment of each other covers a multitude of flaws that, we just like being with the person for whatever reason. And so, good things will come out of it. It's unfortunate because sometimes a student might have maybe a mental disorder that can't just be solved by like learning social skills. Yeah. But that person still, you know, wants to learn how to draw. And it, but it does affect it, you know. Um, I think I mean, maybe online learning would help those kinds of people, you know? Oh, Stan, I've got to tell you about something I did in the last month that I didn't even intend to mention in this. What's that? At the junior college, we have moved online. And so, the teachers have to go through a certification process to prove that they can te uh, teach online. So, I'm t I had to take four classes that I did in the last month 
And they took some they took some energy and I got tested on them. So I was right back to being a student in order to keep teaching at Fullerton Community College. One of those modules, one of those classes was in dealing with students who have challenges, students with disabilities, and how moving to the online environment can make some things worse no, okay. and make some things better. So we were being schooled in what the research shows about how disabilities can be exacerbated or overcome by online learning. Is it that bullying can become easier online because people aren't there to feel the pain of the person or what what, what was what were the negative things? They did mention that without emoticons and without emotional cues, things can be misread and that is harder on some people than mm. others. They yeah. also talked about the difficulty of, of uh, having to type your words in a chat environment. It was really down. The research is really down on how chat can be counterproductive and mm. confusing to some people more than others. I've seen it be very good, but that was one of the things that came up. It was good for me to have taken that training to heighten sensitivity to that everyone sees the world through different eyes and that when now that we're online, you've got to go through this training and you're going to know that it isn't always easy for everybody. Yeah. And online, you'll probably experience a larger variety of students because they're from all over the world now, um, not just like, a, you know, 80% from the this local area where the school is located and then a, a few people coming in from other cities. Yes. A good deal of my response though was just uh, repentance for having, I apologize to you if you've been in my classes and I have not <laughs> been as empathetic as I should have been. Uh, there's another thing I want to say about this. Uh, yeah. the training and it has to do with being a student because I've been a student for the last month and a half. And the first two modules were pretty good. I learned. The third module was just great. It was called active learning. The difference between passive learning where a student comes into the class, listens to the lecturer, the sage on the stage, as they call it, they take notes and then they take the test. So that's where they're active is they're going to take a toast, but it's a, uh, take a test, but it's essentially all just feed me information, feed me information. Good. I've got it. Now I'll, I'll prove that I've got it. And active learning is in particularly important to online teaching because people don't want to sit in front of their computer with you for six and seven hour stretches. My community college classes go that long. So the idea is to give the students a project that they will do in the next 10 minutes or the next half hour or the next hour. And that way, it's go out into the field and do this. A great one for composition is to do what George Pratt calls vision mongering. You will take 20 minutes. You will take an hour to go out with your smartphone and to shoot pictures that do not include people, that you try to find certain challenges. How can you show the least amount of this thing and yet let people know that it's that thing? How can you find an interesting combination of textures? And to go out into the field, and the rule is don't talk about anything except the task at hand, total concentration, and then come back and share that. That is active learning so that it's not just taking notes, constant projects, feedback on projects, projects, feedback on projects. I loved it. Now, here, here's the point I told it though. I, I went on a long time on that, but the reason I told that is because I needed that because I do a lot of lecturing and people take notes. This is let's do less lecturing and put them on tasks. And I got 100% an A plus on the tests because I cared about this subject. The next subject, the final class, I didn't really care that much for what it was about. 
And I also felt like some of the questions which I answered correctly, they tricked me. One of them was some research shows recently that the difference between a live classroom and online learning, online learning has a little better advantage, but it was so small that it wasn't a big deal. And so they asked the question, uh, there were multiple choice. <laughs> One of them was, you know, does it have a, a little bit better advantage? And I checked that and they, the, the correct answer was there's no discernible advantage because it was too close. It was a trick question and I got it wrong. And so <laughs> I felt like if you're going to do that, I went ahead and got a C. I got a C wow. on, on that course. It's the first C that I've had since I got out of high school. But you know what? Do you know what they <laughs> you know, you what? know what they, you, you know, know what, what they call <laughs> what do they call a medical student who graduates at the bottom of their class do you know what they call them a medical student who graduates at the bottom of their class they call them a doctor cuz they graduated yeah I, oh okay <laughs> I got to see I could have gone back and taken it for a better grade and I thought well, I don't care about getting a better grade on that class so I was a good student good students get Cs in the right subject that's an interesting cop out there, Marshall. Okay, so you're putting it back on me. <laughs> Do you know what they call the worst doctor in the world? A doctor. <laughs> uh, no, wait a second. Yes, that, but the one who graduates at the bottom of the class might be a very good doctor. I know. I'm just saying. <laughs> who kind knew of a... not to waste time on stuff that isn't going to save this patient's life. Not always. Sometimes they're just always. the worst. No, but it could be. Okay, here was the big <laughs> purpose of telling all that. It's the difference between studying to the test. When I took a class in sociology of education, uh, there was a lot of controversy back then about studying to the test because it doesn't make people better at what they do. But my teacher defended it by saying, studying to the test, give me information, I'll take a test on it. It, it does do one good thing. It teaches you to pass tests and life is full of tests. But a couple of those subjects, as soon as I pass the test, I'm never going to think about them again. The one that I did because I was interested in it, I'm going to be applying it even this summer. Yeah. Hey, there was one other thing that we didn't mention. This has to do with what we were talking about earlier. Ritualizing concentration time is useful. Yeah. That if you're going to, to study, and you're going to be distracted. Isn't it better to take it like a yoga class where you have ritualized it, you've lit the candles, you've cut out the distractions, you've focused, you've got your body posture in there. Not only is that going to sink the knowledge in better, it also is really enjoyable. You've got that sacred time where you're going to concentrate on this subject. That can help you be a better student. That is something I've learned to do and I don't want it taken away from me. Even if I was not studying to any goal, just to have that hour and a half of concentrating. Very, yeah, very enjoyable. Hear ye, hear ye. Okay, anything else? I think that's it. We've, we've overextended our welcome for this one. <laughs> the well is dry now. They've finished their walk if they're walking. They've finished yeah. their exercise if they're at the gym. We, they're, they're not listening to this part anymore. <laughs> no. And if you want to go to experts on this rather than us, I have not taken the course, but I've read uh, through it and it's been very well reviewed. It's how to be a superstar student, I think, uh, from the great courses. Yeah. You have, you've recommended that, or I don't know if you recommended it to me or you, or another episode, but. I've recommended it to myself and I, <laughs> I haven't gone through it, but it's it's very well reviewed. Oh, okay. Oh, so you haven't gone through it? No, I haven't gone through it. But it's it's been so well reviewed, and I've read the reviews, and I've read the synopses of every lecture title in there, and it seems like that would be someone who's devoted a good portion of their life to studying what makes students excel and what makes them not excel. And here is my truckload of twenty four lectures who, that will will help you through that. So, I'm referring you to something I don't know from the inside out, but has been well received by others. Okay, Stan. Okay. I guess we're done? We're done. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Draftsman Podcast. 
We've enjoyed having you here. Kind of, not really. I mean, we, we've enjoyed it, but we, you weren't here. We did it. We said everything we know and more. What, what's our next episode? What do they have to look forward to? People have asked how to study composition, and that is something that we can speak with Ooh. authority on. Well, we, you mean you. I've taught composition a lot to a yeah. lot of students, and I've seen students excel way beyond me. Yeah, I do have some things about how to study composition. All yeah. right. Next okay. episode, how to study composition, everybody. See you next week. We are recording. We are recording. We are recording. And Stan will call. Stan Prokopenko is going to call me. And we're recording. And that is all, that is all. I've got my coffee a little shaky here as we're waiting for Stan to call. I wonder if it's going to take 20 minutes or if we're ready. I've dropped the ball. Sometimes when you can't think of a rhyme, it's a little awkward when you're on camera and there's no cuts, there's no editing, there's no saving it. It's just you did it or you didn't do it. I'm feeling a little self-conscious.